Okay, ready when you are. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I don't know how you want to do it, if you want to pose the question or you can just go through your list and see how we go. Okay, um, uh, so um, the first question I have for you, Patrick, um, is can you briefly introduce yourself? I know I've just mentioned your name, but like what got you into planning, who's Patrick Bowers, what developments have you been involved in and stuff? Okay, great. So, yeah, I'm a consulting town and regional planner at BBH Town Planning. So what we mainly do is um, assist developers or people from the general public with um, various town planning applications in order to increase the rights on their properties. So that could range from just small subdivisions or consent uses up to larger township establishment applications and those kind of aspects. Okay. Um, in the past, we did do certain amount of strategic planning, kind of small precinct plans and those kind of things. But um, yeah, we haven't been that involved in those type of projects recently. So those are those aspects. Thanks. And what are your duties and responsibility as a planner? So we all basically... Um, get an inquiry, we'll look at the property, assess it in terms of the spatial planning, what existing rights it has, where it's situated. Um, certain of the property owners would want us to do a due diligence on the property or a highest and best use kind of analysis. Others would already come to us and know what they're wanting. And then we would um, look at what the spatial planning is and what the chances of getting the required rights for them is okay. so yeah that, that would basically be and then obviously if it's in line with all of that then taking it forward um, submitting the applications and then Planners normally have a bit of a project management role because there's a coordinator coordination of the other kind of inputs from people like land surveyors, geotechnical engineers, um, architects, um, environmental consultants. Um, so it's, it's trying to coordinate all of those who feed into the town planning process. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And then what is your current, your current focus or major project? Okay, so we are um, personally have been quite involved in uh, residential large scale development in Proti Glen area, industrial commercial in Ikuruleni, um, and then we've got a few shopping centers and those kind of things that we deal with. Yeah. Okay, and then now let's go to the general uh, transportation question. So, how is transport managed and how should it be managed? in the future this is basically one way we deal with the perception so like from your perceptions how do you feel like transport is managed but from your knowledge how do you suggest we try and manage it better going forward okay so you know from my specific town, town planning point of view that we deal with it we kind of engage with transportation on Kind of the three levels of government so you've got your national government that is responsible for like your national road network so sanrol you'll have prasa uh, passenger rail agency south africa so there's large-scale commuter mm -hmm. um, trains and things like that uh, then your next level down would be the provincial government so Gauteng department of transport and works, public works, I think. And um, they are basically be involved in aspects like your taxi manage, taxi licensing. Um, they manage the provincial road network. Um, what else are their responsibilities? Um, Yeah, um, 
So it's a strategic road network, taxis, um, and then below that you would get your Johannesburg Road Agency, your local government um, transportation agencies, as well as their subsidiaries in terms of public transport, so like Metrobus and Ria Via and those kind of aspects. Okay, thanks. And then from your experience, what is the problem with the transport system and what steps are to be taken to fix them? <laughs> okay. From your experience. Maybe it could be inconvenience, maybe it could be a multitude of factors like, I don't know, yeah, look, uh, what I was, I was thinking about was, you, you know, what are the problems? It's kind of re reliability, the okay. cost effectiveness and convenience um, of public transport and even, you know, normal private car ownership transport and how they interact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you'd most probably find that if you sitting on the N1 highway in the mornings and see the Gau train go by, you'll start thinking about shifting onto that as an alternative form of transport. If it's cost effective, it can get you to the same place in the same time. And, uh, you know, it's going to be running every day. Um, if you don't have that as an option, then, you know, there are various levels of financial availability to you well that you've got to choose a transport type based on what your specific circumstance are so if you sitting in an area that doesn't well you can't afford private transport then you're going to have to use minibus taxis or bus or um, train so then kind of feeds in well is that actually an efficient way to get people to where they want to go or can they access where they want to go through those various mechanisms okay. so that's often why i think in the south african context private transport trumps because there's not that degree of access to a well-connected public transport network Okay, so the degree of access to the work connected. Okay, I like that. And then um, the second part, what steps are to be taken to fix the, the, the transport problem? Okay, <laughs> well, that's where it becomes, you know, more of a specific, you've got to be a, supposedly a, a transport engineer or something like that. But I suppose it's got down to basically the budget allocation okay. um, to implement and maintain the various types and levels of transport that is available. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's fine implementing these things but if you're not going to follow it up with maintaining them and keeping them operating then it's only one day that you're left stranded and you'd rather join a lift club or take your own car or do something like that i guess yeah okay i like that um what are the challenges being faced by planners when it comes to promoting sustainable transport <laughs> Let me see, I think that was my thing there. I was saying it was also basically this issue of the various roles and what budgets they have to implement public transport systems and maintain them. Um, So the budget seems like it's a major factor. Yeah. Not sure if you jumped on the 
is that a question that um oh i was the uh, uh, general transportation what are the challenges uh, that face by planners when it comes to promoting sustainable transport And then, um, um, yeah, number four. Do you yeah. think the transportation system in Midrand is connected? Okay, so this one I had a bit of a, a look at for you um, to see if I could kind of understand that. So I kind of went back to the nature of the beast okay. of, you know, how Midrand actually developed. So... You basically had originally these peri-urban small holdings and farm portions and there was definitely an originally uh, uh, planning requirement that if you wanted to develop industrial land in the Gauteng region or basically this was even pre-94 that Midrand would be one of the areas where you could actually locate your industries so um, in terms of the legislation at that time if you wanted to develop a factory or something like that then um, that is where they would encourage one of the areas that they would encourage um, basically industrial commercial land uses and you basically had this node that has now developed as a linear node along the N1 highway system. And that was obviously primarily, uh, well, totally uh, private car based. Yeah. So, you know, you, you can see it in all the planning that you still had this linear node that had developed then basically in 2010 you had the cow train network mm -hmm. that was implemented and you had the midrand station that was created and linked onto the midrand station you would have basically your bus network um that links so it's quite interesting to look at and just see you know all the local bus networks from the midrand station are basically purely linking into the existing nodal area which is primarily office parks and industrial parks so you know, you'd have your Nerdweg um, link that maybe goes to your residential, but it basically follows the area around Voda World and all of that area that is basically more office linked. And then you got your link to the Mall of Africa, and then your area through more industrial areas. Um, on the eastern side of the N1 and then possibly your link to Sunning Hill that basically goes through Waterfall okay so you know in terms of connectivity that's basically resulted in you having a, a station which is your main well I don't know what percentage of your public transport system it would be. So it basically brings people in from the areas that are connected with the car train um, and then disperses them to jobs within the node. But if you're actually a resident in Midrand, there's very little alternative public transport other than minibus taxis. So if you're living basically even in the surrounding um, these affluent areas of Ivory Park and Ebony Park and things like that, I don't know that you're going to benefit from any formal public transport network. You're going to have to rely on 
the minibus taxi. Um, so I don't know if that is really an ideal situation, uh, but I think it's just a historical um, uh, what's happened in the area and how it's developed. Yeah, because yeah. it seems like uh, Gauteng and Johannesburg are starting to, I mean, sorry, Pretoria and Johannesburg are starting to come together. Yeah, well, I think they basically are. But, you know, that's the problem with, um, I saw one of your questions was basically, what are these, well, your initial question was most probably more as to how the various levels interact and what are the problems with that interaction. And that's the big problem in terms of public transport. If you've got each of the metros developing their own bus services, it's they're very kind of focused on their specific metro area rather than interconnecting at all. So if you're living in a Kuruleni or Chwani or, or somewhere like that to kind of get to anywhere in Midrands other than through the car train or using your own car is going to be quite difficult. Mm. I think it's even a challenge with uh, minibus taxis in a way. True. I think, yeah, that's well answered. That's mm -hmm. well answered. Exactly. And then uh, uh, the role of the planner. What is your role in planning cities that encourage and promote sustainable transport okay so yeah with all our planning applications mm -hmm. we all have to look at the spatial planning which obviously has a component on how they see the public transport or the even the road transport network developing mm. so you'll have your spatial planning that takes that into account and then as developers decide to start developing the land they've got to do it in accordance with that spatial planning so when you apply uh, you'll have to get a transport engineer traffic engineer involved and they would have to ensure that you're also in compliance with each of the level of government's spatial planning. So, yeah, it's, um, it's quite important to um, keep, keep all of these layers in mind because, for example, uh, just, um, you know, you would obviously have to get comments from uh, Sandroll from a national road transport point of view, um, but that's mainly ensuring that you are kind of not encroaching onto any of their, their larger national road network. But the provincial roads guys, they've got a strategic road network plan which um, they've actually ensured that that trumps any local legislation. So they, in the, about, I think it's 2001, the Gauteng Transport Infrastructure Act basically ensured that all their strategic road network is protected and that no planning legislation could override it. So you've got quite an extensive network of existing roads and then planned roads. And that uh, basically needs to be taken into account. Um, so I just printed out the ones for you for that affect the Midrand area. So, see it's basically oh, which are the ones now we got the N1 so this would be um, the N3 
ring road and then you've got the M1 going into the centre of Joburg and then the M1 going there but we'll have other roads like Allendale is a K58 and the oh, kind of old Victoria road so and things like that. Okay. Yeah. I just please ask you, what is a K58 road for a person who might uh, not know what that is? Okay, so you'll have in the provincial road planning, you'll have PWV routes. So they are basically your interregional routes that will have very few access points onto them. Um, so that will basically be like a, a standard kind of highway road. Um, your K routes are more regional distributors. So they also have limited access onto them. Um, so they'll be something like Allendale Road or the R101 or the old Pretoria Road that goes through Halfway House and those areas. Um, and certain of them um, are aligned with the local government roads. So it's um, also quite difficult to well, really determine whether the responsible authority is the local authority or the provincial or possibly both when it comes to certain of these roads. So, um, yeah, for example, if you're wanting to plan anything on Allendale or on the, what's it, R101 or Pretoria Road, you'd have to get a traffic engineer involved and he would have to inform you exactly what you can and can't do in um, close proximity to the road and how you're going to get access on and off that road. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so... No, I think you've covered it. <laughs> yeah. what, what's also quite interesting about these is you've got a lot of undeveloped routes in the Kauteng region and I think that has a huge advantage for potential public transport rather than just developing them as uh, private car ownership routes. So you've got these dedicated routes that would become ideal if you were to implement a, a bus route or a, even a a dedicated taxi route because the reserves there it would basically be often the land hasn't been expropriated from the landowner so that's where the cost and the budget comes in is that you need to actually compensate the landowner for the reserve that's been uh, set aside uh, but actually hasn't been utilized as yet. Okay, thank you. Um, then um, now the second question, uh, which departments or state authorities are involved in the development of sustainable transport projects? And the last part, to what extent do these departments work together? Yeah, so that <laughs> all kind of starts to blur now because you have these various levels of um, departments that are responsible for planning and implementation. And when you apply for any rights or anything like that, it basically starts, you start at the highest level, which is national, work your way through the provincial, and then the local guys will give you the final sign off on what you are asking for so the, the local guys won't give you a response until you have ensured that you are complying with the guys higher up but from a strategic road network and planning and development kind of point of view i think there's a bit of integration or what could you say for a better word um, like you know how trans has all these planned routes and reserves but 
you know, they won't allow uh, K root reserve to be developed for something less than a K root. They want to implement it at the full extent rather than just maybe doing a, a bus route that's just a strip. You know, you'll just need a single lane tar kind of uh, roadway to enable buses to run in one direction and they can pass at certain areas. You could have a bus train almost even. So those kind of things haven't been kind of looked at, I don't think, in kind of a large degree, even for like a taxi route. I mean, if you're sitting in a taxi, that's most probably why they drive so erratically is that they need to get their commuters to wherever they need to drop them off in the least amount of time. If they are separated out into their own system, that it would actually speed up that kind of and lower the conflict between your passenger cars and your public transport, basically like your rear vias implementing along Louis Buerta and those kind of things where they've got a dedicated uh, public transport um, road reserve. Okay, and then um, thanks for that uh, well answered response. Uh, and then the third question is, do you think the regulations from the transport agency are inclusive? Furthermore, do you think the funds set aside for public transport are sufficient? Okay. Yeah, I think this is where it also comes down to, um, you know, one, one level of government kind of imposing its agenda on the next level of government so you'll have this kind of legislation environment with the Gauteng Transport Infrastructure Act that says well we've got all these routes and if you're a local government you can't take any decision that's contrary to that um, so yeah um, those are the kind of things where it becomes difficult to know what the interaction between provincial and uh, local is, or even national and local, um, because they've each got their own ideas on how they see areas developing, and it should actually be more integrated, I think, than it, it is. Um, obviously, in determining their spatial planning, um, the local authorities will take into account um, what is planned at a national and provincial level because it's got to be um, a plan that speaks to all of those levels of government as well. But um, often that's just lip service and they'll actually like to maybe do away with certain of the, the planned um, higher order routes. Okay, and then do you think the funds set aside for public transport are sufficient? <laughs> well, that's where I think you've got to look at what the IDPs in the local municipalities are saying and where the money is being spent and what it's being spent on. So if you're looking at city of Johannesburg, obviously they're trying to spend their money on the corridors of freedom in terms of their public transport budget allowance. And so an area like Midrand is not going to be resourced. It's going to rely on the car train and the bus routes and the minibus taxis until there's you know, that that network can be expanded. And possibly that's the way to go because, um, you know, a lot of the residential development in Midrand has been fairly low density. So you aren't getting a good bang for your buck if you're putting in a transport system because you're not going to have the utilisation that you are if you're doing it in an area that has higher densities or a better chance of densifying in the short term. Yeah, 
thanks that was so nuanced and then the last question for the role of a planner do you think that decentralized solutions like private uh, uh, decentralized solutions would be the, which would mean private providers for example your e-hailing which would be your uber drivers have helped planning in creating strategies yeah look i think any different type of transport mm -hmm. is important because it speaks again to that um, reliability and flexibility and um, those kind of issues with public transport so for example what would put you off public transport if it's raining you don't want to wait for a bus or a, um, a minibus um, taxi to get to maybe the car train or whatever and uber drivers will fulfill that ro role in a emergency situation or you you can't you're wanting to get from a to b faster than waiting for when the next train or bus is and that creates your flexibility um so i think it's it's quite important that that aspect does fulfill a role and is quite a most probably important role in terms of encouraging more people to use public transport on an ongoing basis okay thanks for that answer and then do you think the transport system in Midran has improved uh, has improved and please substantiate <laughs> this is <Well>. your take <laughs> <laughs> oh being a good car owner and car driver <laughs> That's so i'm perfect. not the one to uh yeah uh, kind of give much on this one but um you know i think it hasn't really progressed since the car train was implemented um what what i think you need to maybe look at is um you know there were planning reports urban design frameworks and things developed for Midrand around the Khaotran station and things like that and how it should have integrated with the minibus taxi facilities and things like that because I don't think that has really been explored or improved so you'd have your kind of how train development that's great if you middle income or upper income or whatever but if you are the majority of public transport um, commuter you are reliant on the midi bus taxi facilities and i don't know when you were last in midrand kind of cbd area but that taxi facility isn't great and they haven't really done anything to improve that or develop it um, in conjunction with um, the car train so you know I think if you're going to create the opportunities and also encourage development in the midnight ran node um, those are aspects that local government needs to look at in terms of actually improving because that will improve the entire environment i think um in the short to longer term um, depending on how quickly those things are implemented okay um that's a nice that's a nice answer and then the second question what do you think can be done to reduce car dependency in madrid yeah, I think, you know, once again, it gets back to this kind of providing safe, efficient and affordable public transport. So, you know, if you're wanting to get people out of their cars, um, you have to create the alternatives. But, you know, is Midrand the area where they should be spending their money if you've got a defined budget allocation for public transport is that the, the, the best area that the city can utilize those funds 
Um, so I think that's what needs to be looked at. Um, you know, and you know, uh, a lot of these the 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 spatial planning for city of Johannesburg is now gone towards this transect planning and this nodal review policy and I'm not sure if you've looked at that but you know other than the Midran node in this linear area along the the N1 highway the periphery even between your areas of Ivory Park and Ebony Park are proposed for very low density development so the likelihood that you're going to up the densities to improve the public transport links um, is kind of questionable. And then your areas to the west of the highway are largely being developed as cluster housing and uh, lifestyle estates and those kind of land uses where people that are buying into those developments are likely to have a private car. So yeah, it's quite nice for that income group to have access to an alternative form of transport. But um, if there's this need to have rather alternatives for people that can't afford the luxury of a private car, you need to actually be focusing on those areas, I would think. Okay, no, makes sense. So it's a question of priorities, I hear you. Yeah, so you've got to look at your spatial planning and see what you're proposing and if it doesn't gel with um, the, the fact that at these kind of densities you're not going to be able to get public transport, well, then you just basically are enabling the, the kind of nodal areas to develop and there you've got your car train buses and your minibus taxi network. Uh, I would think the issue with a car train bus is that if you don't use the train you pay a premium for your ticket to ride on the bus. So it's not very enabling if you aren't going to be using the train to do a longer commute. So that is, I think, a, a huge problem because you drive past a car train bus and there are about two people on it normally. So, you know, that doesn't actually make sense to me is that you're kind of prohibiting the balance of the people that just want to get around in the, in the node from using that facility because they're not going to go on to you use the train and uh, you know I had a look at those timetables and things that I pointed out so you know you're looking at a 20 minute to half an hour interval between buses so if you could get that down by upping the number of people using them you know you can get it down to 15 or 10 minute and then you're going to have a lot more people using them again um, so, you know, those are the kind of things that need to be looked at if you're going to start um, trying to get people out of their cars and into public transport. Okay, I hear you. And then the last question, do you think increased car usage will decrease the functionality of the car train system? Um, so this I uh, would understand, so if you're going to build additional highways like the PWV 9 or 5 or whatever, are you going to lead to Caltrans not being able to operate? And I don't think so. I think there's definitely a place for each of these and in order to get your economy to grow and develop, you know, your you either have to look at you know road transport as whether you're going to get all your trucks and things like that onto train transport as well because the road transport is now being used by trucks and private individuals and 
it's a, a problem um, if you don't have the alternatives. So I think you, you're you not going to compromise a car train by building additional roads. If you're going to use a car train, you can use a car train just from a convenience point of view. And also the capacity of the car train is fairly limited, I think. You know, they don't have the same capacity as, for example, a uh, Prasa commuter train. They have fairly small, smaller trains. So, yeah, it would be also interesting to identify what the capacity is and what the ability of the area around the station, for example, is to actually grow just purely on the, the train capacity point of view. Thank you very much, Patrick. That was so insightful. And uh, I appreciate your time and please enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, that's it. And yeah, thanks a lot.